From the heartland of America and the gateway to the West, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. Later tonight, ancient sites. Here's what's happening. Fears that the Gaza war could trigger a wider, more devastating Middle East war are growing as clashes with Iranian-backed Hezbollah intensify along Israel's northern border with Lebanon, and Israel presses ahead with its plans for a ground incursion into Gaza aimed at destroying Hamas. Iran has warned of a possible preemptive action against Israel in the coming hours as Israel readies for a ground offensive on the Gaza Strip. Dr. John Curtis, onlinecolumnist.com with us here. John, it's getting worse. It's not getting any better, is it? Oh, no, it's just heating up right now, George. And, and I think that, the, you know, the average, you know, American listening to this should be well advised uh, to be vigilant right now because not only are we going to have a war going on over in Israel with Hamas, but we're going to have a terrorist war that's going to repeat itself. We've all seen what happens with terrorism. But the you know, Iranian Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has called for jihad right now, you know, threatening to use all his proxy forces that he uses against Saudi Arabia, that he uses against, you know, other, uh, you know, the United States and, and others are going to be turned loose in this uh, Israeli-Hamas conflict. Now, do I think that it will uh, morph into a regional war involving uh, legitimate uh, U.N. states like the Gulf states or, uh, you know, Egypt, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Jordan and other Mideastern states? No, I don't, including uh, Hezbollah will be checked, I think, in Lebanon, because Lebanon is in disastrous economic conditions right now, and they can't afford to be decimated by Israel because – Hezbollah, which is, as you know, backed by uh, Iran, uh, decides to start shooting off missiles. So I don't think those attempts to expand the war are going to go very far. But remember today, Biden traveled all the way over to uh, Tel Aviv to meet with um, uh, Netanyahu, and then he was supposed to travel to Amman, Jordan, to meet with King Hussein and Mahmoud Abbas. Now, Abbas told, uh, canceled the trip. And, George, the reason why Abbas canceled the trip is because he was told by Hamas, if you visit with Biden, you're going to wind up like Arafat did. And if you remember what happened to Arafat on November 11, 2004, it was heavily rumored that he was poisoned by Hamas. They killed him. So Abbas has no power whatsoever. Hamas is a vicious terror group that uh, subscribes, like Iran does, to Hitler's final solution, not just of destroying Israel, but of killing all Jews. So these are, uh, you know, there's a very sick group of people. And Netanyahu has vowed that he's not going to allow another Holocaust to happen in Israel with his neighbor Hamas that is now slaughtering and massacring Israelis and could continue doing it. So I think As far as the question about whether this spreads or not, I don't think it will spread to regional powers. It may spread to other proxies of Iran. But I think the U.S. Homeland Security better ratchet up that uh, uh, alert system because we could be facing some real terrorist threats here in the United States. Sadly, you may be right, John. John's website, onlinecolumnist.com. Jordan van der Sloot, the prime suspect in the disappearance of Natalie Holloway. Remember her is expected to do, take a plea deal after being charged in an extortion plot involving the Holloway family. Natalie Holloway was 18 years old when she took a senior trip to Aruba in May of 2005 with the Mountain Brook High School. Natalie Holloway was last seen leaving a bar with van der Sloot, but she was never found. In January 2012, a judge legally declared Holloway dead after a request from her father. Vandersloot is facing charges of extortion and wire fraud in the U.S. after allegedly attempting to sell Beth Holloway, Natalie's mother, information about the location of her daughter's body. Sad story. 
The Food and Drug Administration is considering a ban on certain hair straightening products, saying they are linked to hormone-related cancers and can cause long-term adverse health effects. According to an FDA release, the agency is considering a ban on formaldehyde and other formaldehyde-releasing chemicals like methylene glycol in strengthening products. The agency said the chemical hair straighteners release human carcinogens and can cause long-term adverse health effects. Spending at U.S. retailers continued to grow last month, a fresh sign that the American shoppers aren't tapping out just yet. But is that good news? Let's check in with investment advisor Charles Coppas. Charles, what do you think of that? Well, there's a lot of details here, George. Uh, This new report, you know, says it was adjusted for seasonality and not inflation, whatever that means. And uh, so a 7% increase in retail minus inflation is around 3%. But most of the sales that I've seen uh, here are increases for food and energy for families. And, you know, both are excluded from the core inflation index. And we know that inflation is much higher than 4%. So, you know, spending is up but for different parts of uh, the economy. 70% of this economy is consumer spending. And we know the consumer really is tapped out with you know, record personal debt, low savings, flat wages. And in the same report, one chief economist at a bank said wages are outpacing inflation, quote. And then another in the same report says, chief economist, incomes are being squeezed by inflation. And so which is it? Is it up or down? You know, it's, it, you know, we talk a lot about inflation here, but it, in all my years, I've never seen a topic more obfuscated, misunderstood, and tortured than the root cause of inflation, because people like to blame the weather, the politicians, and greedy corporations, why you see a lot of strikes going on right now this year. And, you know, the main, the main root cause is really just an increase in the money supply in a debt-based economy. And this is what we have. The Fed just added, what, $2 trillion in the last four months. And now the Fed's trying to raise rates with demand destruction. And, of course, we see that elsewhere in different parts, uh, keep inflation at their magic 2%. And uh, we're seeing money velocity levels at the 1929 levels. I've seen the charts. I mean, you know, people are struggling. Businesses are struggling. People are buying what, you know, the things that they have to because we have a consumer uh, economy. But, you know, we could probably be facing even bond downgrades. Fitch ratings just said that the free lunch is over with all the higher rates now and and, uh, unsustainable debt. But so retail sales might be up for food and energy in some sectors, but, but energy costs is a concern because that could get much worse, George, if we had an oil embargo of some kind. You remember in perhaps 73 with the Yom Kippur War, that was exactly 50 years ago, and we saw a 400% increase in oil. It went from $3 to $12 a barrel. I mean, that sounds pretty cheap. It was 36 cents a gallon. Yeah. You know, so those, those were the good old days. But in 1975, Kissinger started the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as an energy uh, uh, emergency stockpile. But earlier last year, Biden started releasing oil to keep the prices low. And now we're at the lowest level since 1983. And some estimates are saying we could have less than 20 days to meet the current demand at the demand levels we have today, 20 million barrels a, uh, a day. I've even heard 17 days. But, you know. Gas prices might be low now, but they but they could have a really huge increase if we if we uh, if we have some kind of a a war breakout. You know, we haven't talked since this war in Israel began, but I I saw a disturbing report with a summary of ten things that could happen as a result of this conflict. And Sean thinks that there it won't be a wider regional conflict, but if it does become that, and the U.S. does get involved, and we put the carriers over there now and everything then OPEC would respond with an oil embargo. Iran could restrict the Strait of Hormuz, which they've done before. We see we could see $300 a barrel. It's 80 right now. Europe could have an LNG gas shortage, not to mention NATO and Ukraine. Uh, there would be a spike in the financial markets and the energy costs. That would be inflationary. There would be social unrest, central banks intervention. Financial markets would collapse with the banking sector, and then the Fed will be forced to bail out the markets, and we end up with hyperinflation. And that could be related to, to the petrodollar, that whole thing. But things have a way of slipping away from us, and uh, that's quite a scenario. We could hope that cooler heads prevail and all this, but it might be a good idea for people to make some uh, personal preparations for these uncertain times and keep our eye on this. Just in case. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate it.
A woman living in a haunted 1920s New Mexico home says her cat and son see a haunting presence. Renee Valdez said her son told her about a man that I see in my room with an old hat that peeks in from the bathroom. Could it be the hat man? Valdez reportedly spoke to the previous owner who said, oh, I've been expecting you to call me. How about that? In a moment, Freeman Chop joins us. We're going to talk about his latest work, The Empowerment Solution, Six Keys to Unlocking Your Full Potential with the Subconscious Mind, next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Dr. Friedman Schaub is our guest for the next couple hours, a physician, researcher, personal development coach, and author of the award-winning book, The Fear and Anxiety Solution. He's also written The Empowerment Solution, which we'll be talking about. His research and advice has been featured in many publications, including Nature, Medicine, Oprah Magazine, Huffington Post, Reader's Digest, Teen Vogue, and Shape. He is the host of the Empowerment Solutions podcast, lives between Seattle, Washington, and the south of France. Friedman, welcome to the program. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, When you wrote The Fear and Anxiety Solution, which was back in 2012, tell me about that for a little bit. Well, you know, I had anxiety for many years. I mean, I grew up with anxiety. I had also anxious parents, so there was no wonder that I was picking up something of that. And uh, when I got into medicine and uh, I was specializing in cardiology, I saw how so many people were anxious and so many people just had a lot of stress in their lives, but we just didn't have the time or the capacity to do anything about that. And so over time, I realized that, you know, rather than just scratching the surface and uh, treating the symptoms, what if I can help people actually to address what causes the physical problems in the first place, which is stress, anxiety, fear that so many are struggling with. And so through many different turns and twists in my life, also, you know, looking into molecular biology and getting a PhD in molecular biology, I found that really looking deeper into the subconscious mind is the key for us to unlock that whatever uh, healing power we need to overcome fear and anxiety. And, and that's how I specialized in, in that topic and, and then wrote a book about how I have been helping my clients to overcome this without medicine or without any kind of anti-anxiety medication. And 11 years later, out comes the Empowerment Solution, Six Keys to Unlocking Your Full Potential with the Subconscious Mind, which we'll get into. In your opinion, Friedman, what is the subconscious mind, and and where is it? (laughs) That's a very good question. Where is it? I would say it's everywhere. It's not just in your brain, because we know, for example, our gut has its own brain, and and the subconscious is kind of the the force that uh, connects all of our uh, nerve cells and all of really our entire being. Uh, when I got into the subconscious, I really didn't know so much what to think about the subconscious because most of us have more a, a negative association with this. That's a place where you know you've got bad habits from. That's where the nightmares are. That's where your father's voice is when you sit down and tells you that you're lazy. So I didn't really feel the subconscious was so great. But then I really found that this is the greatest force inside of us, and we are not really using it. You know, some say that we are using only 10% of our potential. But if we would really use the subconscious, I think we could all live to 100% because the subconscious keeps track of everything that we ever experienced, even when we were in the womb. It's the library of our life. It's a personal physician that keeps track of all the body functions, and it never sleeps because our heart and our breathing continue, even if you're not consciously aware of it. It's a supercomputer who is proven to uh, decipher information way faster than our conscious mind, which is why we have chemistry, gut feeling, intuition, or just like when someone is watching us from behind, we kind of know it, we feel it. It's a bodyguard, which is where fear and anxiety comes from. It's the artist where we have visionary ideas, creativity, a sense of beauty. 
And it's the one that wakes you up in the morning when you say, I need to get on coast to coast at 7 o'clock <laughs> without even an alarm. It just happens automatically. So it's a great friend, and we just need to really get closer to it. Is it easy to access at will? Well, it's easy to access when you know the language of the subconscious because, you know, let's, for example, say affirmations. A lot of people use affirmations to will themselves into feeling better, but the subconscious really doesn't understand words. It's like speaking, I don't know, a foreign language. It just doesn't get it. There are ways the subconscious understands which are more the the visualizations, the, the feelings, that that sensations, all of those things are ways to reach the subconscious. And when we do this consistently, the subconscious is a very willing learner. Why does it seem, doctor, that fear has a lot to do with this? Well, fear is a primary mission of the subconscious. It has two missions. One is to protect us and keep us alive. The other one is to make us happy. But if anything seems kind of out of whack or we're feeling a little, you know, in danger, the subconscious goes into its protective mechanism. And and that is where fear is a signal. It's like keeping us on alert. And it also creates uh, physiologically the fight and flight response that gets us ready to either run away or really face whatever we are dealing with. So that's a very important function of the subconscious, because keep in mind, the subconscious was there for us when our conscious mind was literally in the infant's uh, shoes. It couldn't really even, you know, compute anything, but the subconscious was already looking over us. So it's kind of also a super nanny that still thinks, well, I'm not sure you can handle life. Let me take over when push comes to shove. What creates fear, Friedman? What creates it? Well, you know, you can look at it from two different places. The one, you know, from the brain side, there are certainly different parts of the brain that are designed to create fear, especially that midbrain and the amygdala that many people talk about, which is kind of the anxiety switch. That's one part of it, and that creates in all these uh, biochemical changes in the brain. And then there is also the other side you can look into that's uh, subconscious. And, and there you would say, well, the subconscious creates fear by ultimately looking at the world through different filters. Let's say you have been growing up in a not quite stable environment. You automatically have the assumption subconsciously that Maybe you get hurt again. Maybe you get abandoned again. Maybe something will just, uh, you know, some shoe will drop. And the subconscious needs those filters to keep you safe. Because let's face it, there is so much information around us and so much is, you know, that we are bombarded with. We cannot take it all in. So one of the jobs of the subconscious is, okay, I'll only let in what's really important. And if you're more prone to fear what comes in, is what looks scary or what can potentially harm you. And that is how the subconscious keeps you always on the lookout and and unfortunately also keeps you always in that survival pattern. Now, a lot of people like to get scared. I mean, uh, kids go to these horror movies and things like that. They enjoy that. Is that healthy? I think it's healthy in many ways because it teaches us something. So from a from a subconscious perspective, there are three reasons why it's actually enjoyable. The, the first one is, you know, we cannot really watch a movie without the subconscious. You know, if we would look at, at a, a movie or a horror movie only with our conscious mind, we would right away see, well, this is ketchup, this is special effect, this is, you know, stupid. You know, me as a physician, I often look at these shows and I see something you know, in a hospital that doesn't make sense, and I don't enjoy it anymore. So I have to put this all aside and let my subconscious take me on the ride. And so why is it fun, even though it's scary? Because we consciously know we are sitting in our cushy chair, munching away with popcorn, and it's all safe. And it's all also something that you know is temporary, and there is a sense of control with it. But then there are also the releases of the stress hormones that are enjoyable. That is something we feel a 
kind of a high from. And in fact, there is another hormone that's released, which is called dopamine, yeah. which usually elicits pleasure. And what they found is that violence and horror stimulates a form of arousal inside of many people. And that probably comes from those deeper recesses of the subconscious, or as Freud called us, the unconscious, where we have all these socially unacceptable ideas and forbidden fantasies and taboos. They get kind of released. They, they come out. And in some ways, those more primitive aspects, when we get them on a little walk outside with horror movies, it feels afterwards as if we are more alive. There is a certain kind of intensity with it. And, and what studies found is that afterwards, having fun with friends or a good night with the partner is actually more intense because of it. And All right, doctor, hold on for a second. We're at a break, but we'll come right back next. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. We're with Dr. Friedman Schaub as we're talking about his latest work, The Empowerment Solution, Six Keys to Unlocking Your Full Potential with the Subconscious Mind. Exactly what is anxiety, doctor? And where, did, where does it originate? In the brain? Well, it does originate either, you can say, in the brain, which is in the midbrain. And uh, a lot of people who feel anxious would uh, say, well, you know, the more I get anxious, the more I, you know, get triggered by it. And that's something that neurologically we can see in that amygdala that's like the anxiety switch that stays open at all time and, and basically makes everything look scary. But uh, I also like to look at more in an empowering way from the subconscious mind. And, and there it just is a way for us to be constantly on survival and self-defense mode. And, and that's what a lot of people are living in. I mean, just listening to the commercials, you can see there is a lot that you know, we are dealing with lots of uncertainty, lots of uh, no end inside, feeling out of control that makes life right now appear scary. And our subconscious says, okay, this is not like, you know, fun and games. This is really something we have to survive. And then it kicks in with all its survival mechanisms. Why does anxiety sometimes come and go on its own? And, and by that, I mean, you may have it on a Monday, but on Tuesday, it's gone. That's the irrational part of the subconscious, absolutely. And we don't really know what triggered the anxiety. We can wake up completely fine in the morning and then, you know, on the way to work, we all of a sudden feel stressed or anxious. Now, the subconscious has picked up something. It may have been just a, a thought that came up or something you saw on the way to work. And that triggered this anxiety. You know, let's say you saw a homeless person and then the subconscious says, well, this could be you. You are not so aware of the thought, but the feeling shows up. And that's why I always tell people when you have this free floating, all of a sudden showing up anxiety, just really track back and think about what did really happen? What was I maybe thinking like a little bubble or what did I see that may have scared the subconscious? And then we can work on that. I do a lot of live shows and speaking engagements. Just came back from Columbus, Ohio, where we had one in a theater. And I never get nervous before a crowd. If, if anything, I feed off it. And I've been doing that since I was a kid. And maybe that's what's helped me because I had that kind of experience and exposure. But I was stopped behind stage by one of the technicians who said, do you ever get nervous? And I went, no, I really don't. And he said, I couldn't do what you do. I would fall apart. I would get so nervous. So why is it that some people can walk out on stage, do their thing, and be very happy about it? Other people are shaking like crazy. Well, I think the biggest difference is probably when you're there. You really feel not only confidence because of your experience, but also of your message. You know, you want to give people something to think about or to expand their minds. And most people that feel afraid of public speaking see it more as I need to perform and hopefully get liked and hopefully not get thrown, tomatoes thrown at me. <laughs> it's more about them and not necessarily about what they have to say. I worked with a with a speaking coach of uh, Bill Clinton, and, uh, and he said exactly that, that the way you want to go about it is to tell yourself 
It's not about me. It's about that, what I want to share with the audience. It's about the people and the message. What is the difference, doctor, between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind? Well, you know, many people say it's like an iceberg. The conscious mind peaks out there on the top, and the subconscious is this massive part of the mind underneath. And the conscious mind is all about rational thinking, mass, you know, figuring things out, planning, but it's not very emotional. And the subconscious mind is more that the deeper piece. It's about the emotions. It's about, you know, for example, also that, uh, you know, automatic behavior. So many times a day we are doing things while we are in your on our head somewhere else you know driving we are already in the office shaving we don't really pay attention to what's going on it's the subconscious who does all these automatic things some people say 90 percent of our daily activities are run by the subconscious so it's incredibly powerful these anti-anxiety drugs do what and what do they affect well, they affect uh, the brain chemistry, and basically, you know, the idea is to bring more balance into the brain by increasing, for example, serotonin or, or blocking receptors that get too much triggered to make us feel more anxious. And they definitely work. And sometimes we are simply so overwhelmed with the emotion that we cannot really even think our way through it. And so I'm not against medication, but I also feel like they don't necessarily change how we think, how we think about the world, how we think about ourselves. So we have to really do both. We have to work on ourselves and realize it's not just a biochemical problem that makes us anxious. It's really something deeper inside of us. And and then we can use a medication to calm ourselves down so that we can look a little bit deeper inside. Dr. Schaub's website is linked up at coasttocoastam.com. He's also on Twitter X. He's on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You're all over the place. How long have you been doing this? Over 20 years now. Good for you. Good for you. Rattle off the six keys to unlocking your full potential with the subconscious mind that you mentioned in your book. Uh, Well, the keys are basically the things that make us feel more like the leaders of our life. And and what I mean with that is, you know, the reason why I wrote this book is that I saw it's not just about the emotion. It's not just about anxiety. It's about how we then respond to it, how we react to it. And those are the survival patterns that, you know, in in large, you could say they're either avoidance pattern where we just want to avoid getting hurt or reject it, or they're the pleaser pattern where we just like to somehow fit in or get some kind of an approval. And that makes us ultimately disconnected from ourselves, which only increases more anxiety. And so these uh, six keys are ways to get back into your power seat, to really feel like, okay, I'm in charge here. So there is self-commitment, there is self-responsibility, self-reliance, self-awareness, self-compassion, and in the end, it's also self-love. And these are all things our parents would have told us how to do those but they haven't necessarily. So these are very life, important life lessons that make us just feel more confident and calm on a day-to-day life. What is it about being scared that creates anxiety as well? Well, when we are scared, Scared, basically, we're, um, you know, more scared about something specific. You know, anxiety is kind of that where we don't really know what is the danger, but we are still feeling it inside of us. And when we're scared, we are looking more at, well, I'm scared to go on stage or I'm scared to go into this elevator. So then we have a specific movie in our head. And the movie said, well, if it, what if it crashes or what if I'm in there and I get a panic attack? And So it's something that's in some ways a little bit easier to work on because it's not completely overwhelming. It's more contextual, but it can also be debilitating. I know plenty of people that came to me that said, I have to walk to the office 10 flights of stairs because I'm too afraid to go up there in the elevator. (laughs) Interesting. Do you find that slow, deep breaths help with anxiety? Very much, very much. And you know what even is better? When you're laying on the ground and you have your shoulder blades on the hard surface, 
what happens is it stimulates the breathing and that laying down stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite of the fight and flight sympathetic nervous system. So it really relaxes you. After a few breaths, you feel like, you know, your blood pressure come down, your 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 heart rate slows down. It's it's a very powerful stimulation. All of those things that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system are kind of the the innate uh, anti-anxiety medication because it really triggers something that says all is well, relax, let's just uh, you know, take a breath or let's just, you know, digest because that's ultimately what the parasympathetic nervous system is all about. Would you say, doctor, that successful people have learned how to tap into their subconscious mind and use it? That's a good question. I don't know. To be honest, I think some successful people just do it naturally. They have a natural ability to communicate other For example, athletes certainly have learned it. I mean, we know that athletes, you know, let's say football players, are visualizing the perfect throw, the perfect catch over and over again until it's really ingrained deeply in automatic pattern. And certainly the subliminal messages about confidence building or having success or things come to you, everything is easy, That is what uh, the subconscious eventually takes in. You know, I do believe that when we talk about the law of attraction, a big part is having programmed your subconscious to see all the possibilities and opportunities out there and not just ignore them. I was uh, told that really successful professional sport players have an ability to slow down time so that uh, a baseball batter gets thrown a pitch by a pitcher. In his mind, the pitch isn't doing 100 miles an hour coming at him, but it's doing like 30 miles an hour floating at him, and he hits it and it goes out of the park or something like that. Or a hockey player, when he gets a puck passed to his hockey stick, he has the ability to slow down that hockey puck so it kind of slowly comes to him. But they've got this ability. What do you think of that? Oh, absolutely. Isn't it fascinating to hear that? Because it is what I said before about the supercomputer power of the subconscious. You know, when you are dissecting an event like, you know, a ball coming towards you with a small computer, which is a conscious mind, you know, it blends all in and it appears much faster. But if you go with a big computer, the subconscious, you can see all the small movements much more clearly, which then appears like it's slowing down time. Have you found that certain types of music have an effect on people as well? Yes. Music is uh, definitely something that stimulates us. It's something that can relax us. And and it's also what we associate with. You know, for example, my wife doesn't really care for classical music. She always says it's manipulating her. (laughs) I grew up with classical music. And for me, there are all these memories coming up from the past. Nice, you know lunches and coffees and then put a little bit of a cigar smell to it and I see my grandfather next to me and I'm feeling already like a uh, hundred bucks. I mean there are all these stimulations that just the subconscious takes in and all these good or also not so good memories are triggered and coming up and and shaping how we feel in the moment. People who have had anxiety attacks say that they feel as if they're having a heart attack or they're going to pass out, or it's it's really not a pleasant experience, is it? No, it's not. And I think it's really you know important to see that this is what often makes the anxiety worse, that when we do have anxiety and it feels you know, intense, that we are scared of having it again. So it's almost like we are afraid of ourselves, of our own emotions. And that creates a vicious cycle. I often ask people when they had their last panic attack, people that don't want to leave the house because they say, well, what if it happens in the supermarket again? And they say the last time was about, you know, a year ago, but I'm so afraid it's going to happen again. So that secondary anxiety is something very important to work on because there is not anything the anxiety can do to you that creates a heart attack or is actually lethal. It just feels like that. 
when the anxiety attack occurs, does it just like come on? It depends if you have been paying attention or not. If you are kind of just lollygagging through your life, yeah, a panic attack can be the first sign that you have been for a long time dealing with anxiety and it just hits you. And that's what the subconscious does. It says, you know, you're not paying attention. You're blind here on the on the steering wheel. And then it shows you that you have to pay attention. And when it does, then yes, it, it really stops you in the tracks. One of the things that I find so interesting is that often people feel the first time the panic attack after they have done something that they know was wrong or something reckless. They had been on a bender or they had uh, you know, just cheated on uh, their wives or whatever it is, that, that there is almost like a feeling of an emergency break that gets pulled and that doesn't allow them to do this again. The more they think about it, the worse it gets, right? Exactly. Absolutely. What about negativity? Does that uh, contribute to it? Oh, negativity is kind of, you know, the first sign that you may be dealing with a distorted view on yourself or on life. And yeah, looking at your thoughts and just being aware of them. It doesn't have to be only like, you know, looking in the mirror and saying you're fat. It's also about, you know, how you see the world, how you judge it, how you have negative thoughts about, you know, something bad's going to happen. Another world war will break out. All those thoughts can create more and more that feeling of anxiety. And, and often these thoughts are not in our control. They just bubble up. The problem is if we do leave these thoughts unchecked, they're building on each other. And eventually you feel yourself trapped in the emotion that these thoughts are calling because uh, you haven't really said, well, wait a second, this is not happening right now. And it's not even certain that it will happen. So talking to yourself and responding to those negative thoughts is one way to really just alleviate some of this anxiety. Who would you say the Empowerment Solution book is for? Well, I think it's for anyone who feels powerless, anyone who feels like that they want to have a different life, they want to overcome those obstacles that hold them back, you know, procrastinators, people that feel they don't really have a persona because they always blend in people that are the constant pleasers and just give and overgive, never take care of themselves. People that feel invisible and don't want to go out because they're afraid of judgment or hurt or people that are constantly in this uh, sense of being victimized because something happened to them and they still believe it's going to happen again. And that's pretty much all of us, we all have those patterns. All right, hold on, Doc. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back for our final hour with you. We're opening up the phone lines. If you have a story, folks, about anxiety attacks, share that, or a question about your subconscious mind, jump aboard. <laughs> 